This is Bob Sorrentino from Italian Roots and Genealogy. Be sure to check out our blog and our YouTube channel and our newsletter and our great sponsors, your Dolce Vita, Italy Rooting, Phil Italy, and Abiativo Casa. And today I have a special guest all the way from Calabria, Miriam Pugliesi, who is one of the owners of Lido Di Setta. So welcome, Miriam. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Uh, you know, I love talking to people from Italy. It uh, makes makes this special for me, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and especially young people from Italy is even better. <laughs> oh, yes. Uh, so, um, so, you know, let's do a little bit about your background. Where is where's your family from originally in Italy? So um, I was born in Calabria. So uh, Calabria is the boot, is exactly the boot before Sicily, to give you an idea. Um, but my parents moved to Milan when I was less than one year old. So I grew up totally <laughs> nearby Milan. And I came back in Calabria that is more or less one hour, 30 minutes with the plane um, for, for, for holidays. And I really absolutely loved the genuine, um, the, the landscape, uh, the food, the people, the authenticity of the place. Really for me it was like, you know, be wild and free being Calabria. And um, I'm, I'm specializing in foreign languages. And I worked uh, always in international field, also airport. I was, uh, I was also a flight attendant for Lufthansa, and uh, I was really lucky to travel and to also to live in a different part of Europe. And I lived for a while in Berlin, and this experience gave me the occasion to see my homeland with really different eyes, you know? Um, uh, some really, we can say silly things, appears to me really incredible, you know? Um, in Berlin in 2012, everybody was doing guerrilla gardening. So they were planting tomatoes and other stuff in uh, really old style refrigerator or, using the net of the mattress like uh, to, to, to like doors and so on. And I was growing up with my grandfather doing like this. So um, in one of the most important capital of Europe, going back uh, was the, the way to uh, build the future. But my grandparents always did that. So, you know, I have another uh, way to look at them. So, and also was really um, impressive to me, the beauty. You know, we have different conception of beauty. And uh, their conception of beauty was really different from mine. When they say, oh, this place is beautiful, my my level of beautiful is a little different. So, okay, if you will come in our place, what you will do? <laughs> this is beautiful, you know? And thanks to this experience, I made a flight Berlin, Calabria. And now I'm 11 years then I live here. That's fantastic. So, you know, I always ask, I always ask the Italian Americans, what was it like going home? So now since you didn't grow up in Calabria, when when you when you when you went back, you had. I'm guessing you felt like you never left. Is that right? Yeah, but you know we um uh, we always um uh, when we grow up, when people of Calabria grow up, everybody's telling you here there is nothing, here there is nothing, here there is nothing. It's like you know, without stop, and you grow up thinking that here there is nothing. But it's not absolutely like this. So for this reason is really um, important to have another perspective. In this way, we can, you know, remove uh, the soppressata that we have in front of our eyes and see things 
completely in another in another way because i would think that this land is really rich is virgin and there are really a lot of points of view there is really a lot to do but anyway if it if if it was correct that here there was nothing that means that there is everything to do that's my point of view yeah and that's fantastic and i think it's i think it's just so great that you know, you wanted to revive um, an industry that goes back centuries and centuries and centuries. Um, so how did you come about, um, you know, starting a business with, with some friends? You know, um, when I came back here, so Berlin, Calabria, um, I am from a little village. The name is San Floro. We are in the middle of Calabria, so in the middle of the boot. It's the narrowest point of Italy, it's less than 30 kilometers that I have no idea how many miles are. I'm sorry for that. But it's really less than 20 minutes by car uh, from one coast to the other. So uh, this little village has more or less 500 people, included wild boars and cats. And we were there, uh, me and Domenico and Giovanna, in the same time of life where all of us want to stay in this little village, but doing what? So we start like a, a research. What can this territory give, give us, you know? And in San Floro, there was um, an abandoned mulberry orchard with more than 3,000 plants and an abandoned silk museum uh, that was inside a castle. So uh, the property of both was the municipality of San Floro. And we, we understand, uh, we, like, we studied what's going on, why there was a mulberry orchard and abandoned silk museum. And the things are that Calabria was the um, really uh, the most bigger producer of raw silk of Europe between the 15th and the 17th century. So the 50% of the production of Europe between that period was made in Calabria. And if some of you have an idea of how Calabria is, you can see nowadays you can see olive trees everywhere. You have to imagine that in that time, between the 15th and the 17th century, there were mulberry trees everywhere. Like today, there are olive trees. That's why, um, because there was a really um, big production of silk through the silkworm breeding, because silkworm is just mulberry leaves. And to make silk, the most precious yarn and fabric of the world we need to have trees mulberry trees so uh we found also papers of our in our um government archive that say in san floro in the 60th century uh was breed one tons and 600 kilos of silk cocoons i don't know if any of you uh, had a, a silk cocoon in the end, probably I have here one just to give you an idea, but a silk cocoon is extremely light. This is a silk cocoon. I don't know if you can see. Yes, yeah, we see perfectly, yeah. Okay, so uh, imagine one ton, 600 kilos of these, you know, is <laughs> uh, is a really a, a huge thing for a small village like uh, like our village. So we said, okay, let's start from our past to build our future. So we ask uh, to our municipality the permission to manage the land where the mulberry trees were and to manage also the Silk Museum. And now uh, are 10 years that silk is our way <laughs> to live, but also to rebuild. The, con the economy of this territory. That's just that's that's just fantastic, and I mean, uh, you know, such foresight to do that. And uh, you, you know, was the municipality did they 
Uh, did they jump right in and say, yeah, or did you have to really work on them? Yeah, yeah no, no. Also, because I, I was 23 years old when all this happened. <laughs> and I had no idea about the textile industry or agriculture fields. You know, um, I was specialized completely in other kind of things. Also, Giovanna and Domenico, the same. Just Domenico. Uh, has some knowledge because when he was a little like kid, he used to breed silkworm with his grandfather. Because until the generation of our grandparents, all the people used to breed silkworms to uh, like self production because they breed their silkworms to make their own silk, to make their own uh, uh, tablecloth, curtains, or napkins, and so on. So uh, this tradition was going to dis disappear completely with the generation of our parents. So what we did, first of all, we, we kind of stalkerized our elders and the elders of the nearby villages to have the knowledge, to, re to, uh, to learn everything about this tradition before it was too late. Uh, our teacher were more or less 89, 92 years old, to give you an idea. And um, this for, was absolutely the first step for us. They give you knowledges, but these knowledges weren't, weren't uh, enough to build a company. It were okay for like hobby, to give you an idea. So what we did was to backpack and travel all around the world to understand what silk is nowadays. The market, the realities, the production. And uh, this was really useful for us to know really good our roots, but also to combine with, with the international communities and the global market. And um, this was the story to how nowadays we are able to make silk for uh, the traditional production. So we do really um, traditional textile, traditional fabrics, but also we innovate this process and we make silk that is suitable for the eye fashion. So the tradition of our grandparents or our ancestors go on the red carpets. And that was really, and this is really emotional for all of us. That's just, I mean, I, and that's why I wanted to talk to you. As soon as I saw your other interview, I was like, I have to talk to her. I have to get her on <laughs> uh, for a couple of reasons. One is I, I think it's just so noble and great to revive something in in you know in italy that that happened for hundreds and hundreds of years that that uh fell up, fell apart you know in modern uh and um you know to 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 make a, a vibe of business out of it i'll tell you the other reason i'm interested in it is um this is palazzo piomalo in uh, uh fasato and it's the home of my third great grandfather or one of his homes he had many uh but what i learned while we were there was they had a silk industry in the palazzo uh so you know it's like besides having the calabrian link also to have that link to the silk industry was just fantastic to me you know yes absolutely absolutely uh and uh th uh, this you know the um uh the the town of the borghi they wanted to purchase this it's owned it's not in the family anymore unfortunately i wish it was uh they tried to purchase it and the owner won't sell and uh it's we got to go inside and it was really bittersweet because you could see what it once was um but it's you know the the insides really you know are deteriorating rapidly now. Um, the other thing I learned when I was on your site that the museum is in one of the Caracciolo, uh castles, correct? 
Yes, is a Caracciolo castle. Yes, it right. was a, a summer residence of the Caracciolo family. Well, I'm Caracciolo too. My my grandmother. Oh, really? My, my uh, grandmother was Pier Malo, uh, from Piro, from, yes. from the from the uh, Count of Montebello, and she's uh, my great grandmother was uh, Caracciolo di Tocchirolo from the Princess of Tocchirolo and the Princess of Avellino. So the, when I saw wow. the Caracciolo castle, I was like. Oh my goodness, it's one of our homes. <laughs> yes, exactly. Exactly. It's an incredible connection. Wow. Um, wow. But, but you know, we we really love Calabria. We, you know, we went to we don't go to too many places, but we went to Shiela, which was just absolutely beautiful. Oh yes, it is uh, my favorite place in Calabria. She my wife's favorite friend. place, I think, in the world. <laughs> but it is just and, and, yeah. and like you said. The landscape, the scenery, and everything is just like you know, no place we've we've ever seen. Um, but you know, today, you know, Montebello and Fasato, uh, probably similar to to your town. You know, maybe a thousand residents or something like that, uh, and and everything homegrown and homemade. It was just so great. Um, one of the other things I learned looking at your website was uh, that you still you don't use. Um, uh, man-made dyes, right? You use traditional dyes and everything when you... Yes, that's really important for us. Because uh, when we travel all around the world to have no knowledge uh, about the world of silk, we saw wonderful things, but also awful, awful things. And one of the awful things were about the dyes. Because um, the, the dyeing process of silk, but of all the fabric and yours, uh, it's really incredible. Um, it's one hundred percent pollution. It's something that you can really clean away. You know, you are um, creating a permanent pollution on the planet when you do these processes. And we were in India. And uh, all these people were um, dying all these uh, silk skeins uh, without any kind of protection for themselves. We were able to stay there five minutes because we have like kind of red eyes and difficulties to breathe. And they were there like 18 hours a day just with the fabric around, you know, the, the apron, like an apron, yeah. Exactly, nothing else. So, um, but this is wasn't the awful things. The really bad thing was that 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 real really wonderful water. They were like blue, green, yellow. Were that these are full of heavy metals. Uh, were used to, you know, uh, irrigate the nearby fields, and we saw there tobaccos, ginger, and tea to give you an idea. So uh, for us, it was like we were really uh, under shock when we, when we saw all these processes. And we said when we came back that we will never, ever do something like this, never use chemicals to dye. So we did other researches. And uh, one book, we, find, we found one book that was really, really useful for us. Um, it was a research of some uh, scientists of the kingdom of the two Sicily when Italy wasn't Italy, was, um, you know, a lot of kingdoms. So uh, we are in the kingdom of the two Sicilies. And these researchers found 742 naturally um, dying plants. And what means dyeing plants? Means that these plants give the pigment to you and this pigment is resistant to water, to scrubbing and to the, and to the sun. That means dyeing plants. So a strawberry, for example, is not a dyeing plant, but these researchers found 70, sorry, 742 dying plants that surround us in this territory. So start a really, you know, uh, powerful research to 
find these plants all around us. And still nowadays we die just with natural colors. That's, a, that's amazing. That's really, that's really something. And so besides helping the planet and, and being safe for, for you guys, uh, it, it actually is, is more permanent than I guess than, than the, the man-made dyes or the chemical dyes, yeah? But, you know, until the, uh, 1868, uh, all the world used to dye with natural colors because the chemical dyes mm, didn't exist. So it's less than 200 years, 150 years that we die with chemical colors. But for thousands and thousands and thousands of years, we just die with natural color and in the Vatican in all the museum all over the world we have piece of fabrics from Romans from Greeks from Maya and there are they have colors on top so yes absolutely uh the, the natural color last on the fiber the only thing is that all the colors the most um you know uh dangerous things for the color is the sun also if you hang a chemical dyed t-shirt on the sun after two three days a black is not black anymore it's like gray and the same for the other colors so of course it's better to have a better care of our dress clothes garments of course but the results are incredible. So is is uh, purple still the most expensive to, to dye? Yes, it's, of course it's more expensive. Just to give you an idea, um, each uh, natural color has his own way to extract the pigment. There is no one way for everybody. So every plant has his own way to extract the pigment. And from each pigment, we can achieve 25 different shades of colors. And uh, um, is really uh, amazing also the time that you need to achieve that color. So there are some colors that come up after five minutes, other colors that employs 12 hours, you know? So, it's a kind of a science, it's a science. And absolutely ca can't be the same of open uh, plastic things with some powder and, and you know, and dye. <laughs> it's absolutely different. So yes, of course, natural, natural dye is, 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 is more expensive compared to the chemical dye. But I think that our way to see the world, what we dress, what we what we eat, has to change to protect everybody on the planet who dress and who works for dress. Um, yeah, that's that's really so interesting. I, I had no idea. And uh, so you know, start to finish from when the silkworm. Well, how long does it does it take the silkworm to create a cocoon? But what's the timeline from when you? get the cocoon to processing uh, the, the the fabric and dyeing it until actually, you know, putting the uh, the finished product out there. How long does that take? Oh, okay. So step by step. So um, the silkworm life cycle for the breeding is more or less 30 days from eggs, etches, until the silkworm weaving the silk cocoon um all around him so after that we have to wait kind of five six days and we are able to collect all the cocoons uh it depends of which kind of silk we have to do we have different processes to do the conventional silk so the silk that everybody knows in the world we need to dry the cocoons and then there is the reeling process so from the cocoon, we uh, we pull out the thread. Uh, just uh, here, I have some cocoons, but uh, to to remove the the thread from the cocoon, we need hot water. 
but here you you have an idea of how could work the process mm -hmm. and um, then after we reel the silk so from the cocoon we reel the silk we do skein skein of raw silk this skein need to be twist and after need to be degummed because um the silk cocoon is exactly a spool of thread created by the silkworm so the silkworm spin one unique thread all around him that has glue and glue it all together. So the silk cocoon is a glued, a glued spool of thread. When we reel the silk, this glue is on the fiber. So it make, makes the fiber like little shag, little rough. So to have the silk that everybody knows, we need to do the degumbing process. So after doing the degum, there is another twisting, and then there is the dyeing, and then there is the weaving, the weaving of the fabric. So ah, it's kind of long process, uh, but is incredible, amazing. Nowadays there are uh, eight artisans. There are all women, and they work from uh, their laboratories. They are spread all over Calabria. And each one is specialized in one stage of production of silk. So it's like, uh, you know, um, here in Italy, we have Como, we have Prato. There are industrial uh, textile in uh, districts where every company every is specialized in one step of the process. We are more or less the same, but instead of companies, we have artisans we have a human being that each one is specialized on one step of the process and this makes me happy i'm really happy for this because uh you know unfortunately in calabria we have the worst unemployment rate for women of all europe uh and this little network is like a tears in the ocean but this woman have an income and this income they invest in their small uh, villages. And this thing, little, little things, but helps the people to stay in the places, you know, they don't need to go away to find other work. They can still doing their job that is something that is going to disappear. They create income and they invest in their territory. And this is how our idea of development of this region i think that we need something like this because we are we uh are really authentic we are back in time but i think that now this is a, a really good thing for us but we have to know that this is a good thing for, uh, for us and we are have to understand how to manage this to make um, uh you know uh to increase uh, the wellness of the people and the economy of the territory. Oh yeah, no, I I I, I love it. I really love it, and um, and nothing goes to waste, right? You you uh, you use the mulberry fruit, and you use yeah. the, the cocoons, and you you there's all kinds of products that come out of this, yeah. Yeah, so um, I have to tell you that we are the last company in Europe who makes just sericulture. Because there, there are other companies, but they do also, for example, wine or wheat or other things. We do just sericulture and mulberry tree cultivation. But to leave of this, we have to be, to be multifunctional. So for this reason, for us, is um, really important to don't have any kind of waste and every waste has to be a resource. So uh, we use the leaves to breed the silkworms, of course, but also to make teas, uh, the berries, the mulberries, the fruit to make jams, liqueur. And um, we have also a little agriturismo, so our this local restaurant where we use this product so we have also a piece of land we are in organic certified farming so um because 
silkworm is really uh, really um, sensible. It, uh, it need just one little molecules of a chemical that everybody dies. So uh, it's really important that we are inside a pine forest where nobody is near us. So we are kind of in a really uncontaminated place. And um, and we have also land that um, where we grow vegetables and we use in this our small restaurant this agriturismo, and then we have the production of uh, uh, of fabrics of uh, um, scarves of flour of jewels artisans, so uh, artisan art, artisanal products. We have. Um, what people call, call tourism, I don't like this term because um, we, we saw silk like an experience. So people come in our place and they come from all over the world to understand what really silk is. Because when people think about silk, they don't think about um, agriculture. No, don't, absolutely don't think about people working on a really particular condition they absolutely don't know the magic of really the silk from the cocoon is something really magical so uh we let people live this experience and it's not tourism because they we give something to them but all the people give something to us because it's a really uh intimate experience and uh, and then we have also an academy because we teach people how to breed the silkworm how to all the silk reeling technologies how to dye with natural products and uh, how to weave on ancient looms because oh, our artisanal products are we uh, uh, are woven on ancient looms so the silk academy is really working and the 85 percent of our students come from abroad because we are the last place in the Western world who still do this kind of work. That's just great. That's just great. And uh, and so and then you run the museum too. So what what do you have in the museum? In the museum, we have the different kind of silk because there is no one type of silk. There are really a lot. Silk is a world. <laughs> so. Um, here we understand how to recognize the different variety and kind of silk. Uh, there are the natural dyes, the different, the book that I mentioned before, and uh, the different dyes that we use. And there are the looms, and people can weave on ancient looms. So they, they can leave their weft in the warp of San Floro. So... Um, then we go to the countryside where um, people can see our heroes, the, the silkworms. We reel the silk together. This is something that really, this is probably the most magical thing of, of all the experience. And, uh, and then we walk under the mulberry orchard in this really incredible place. That's, that's wonderful. That's really wonderful. Um, so before we go, where can people find you what's the the name of the website and uh and uh how could if they want they could actually purchase things off the website too right yes 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 we have a shop on the website and our website is uh, uh nido di seta punto com. so if you want i can do a spelling is like n-i-d-o-d-i-s-e-t-a dot com you know thank you this was like really enlightening i never had any idea about uh about silk and you know what a big industry it was in calabria at one point in time yeah 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 you know uh the venice is absolutely known florence is absolutely known leon france como nobody think about calabria and that's also why we are doing this job that's just that's just great